Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Christ the Rock. Welcome to everybody who's joining us here in person, but also joining us online on Facebook Live and on YouTube. We are so thankful to have all of you here this morning to, to focus in on a pretty special message today. You know, we've been, we've been looking at the theme, the church that God wants. And today is the last Sunday with that theme. And the church that God wants is one that is quick to forgive. Now that's not always an easy thing to do, is it? Sometimes we hold on to the hurts. Sometimes we hold on to the past instead of letting it go. And we're going to talk more about what that can do to us as we look at the story of Joseph and his brothers. What, what uh, Joseph shows us about forgiveness is the kind of forgiveness Jesus illustrates in the story that he tells. Forgiveness is part of our lives as Christians. And so I pray that as we listen today and as we celebrate this gift, we learn better how to forgive the people around us. As we gather this morning, you have your connection cards in the service folder. There is also the link available in the bulletin that will allow you to do the online connection card. That's a, a great way to stay connected. It's a great way for me to hear from you, your prayer requests, your questions, your joys, your struggles, so that I can add you to my daily prayer list and we can, we can keep going to the Father for you. Our worship service this morning is printed out for you in the service folder. And we'll begin with our opening song, His Mercy is More. This is a new one and we're going to be using it the next couple of weeks to introduce it. It's a beautiful song about God's forgiveness. And it really recalls the story of the prodigal son running back to the Father and looking for his forgiveness. So I will sing verse one and the refrain, and then as you feel comfortable, please feel free to join with me. You don't have to, but we'll be using this the next couple of weeks to, to get us all used to it. have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger 
than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. And so now we come to this God whose mercy is more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So let's take this time then to be honest and authentic with God and confess the things that we've done wrong. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's just take a quiet moment for self-reflection and examination. Our gracious Father in heaven has poured out his mercy on us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as a real payment for the sins of the whole world, yours and mine. As a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join in our song of praise, giving glory to him for this beautiful gift of forgiveness. Glory be to God on high, peace on the earth to all is given. Join us as we glorify, sending our praise as to the heavens. You, Lord God, our heavenly King, O God, the Father, mighty one, Jesus Christ, to you we sing, O Lord, only begotten Son. Glory be to God on high, peace on the earth to all is given. Join us as we glorify, sending our praise as to the hands. Let's join together in our responsive prayer of the day. Almighty God, you have graciously forgiven all our sins and abundantly provide for what our bodies and souls need. Help us trust your mercy and teach us to be merciful to our neighbor 
that we willingly forgive others without judging them and lead lives that give you glory. We ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning, which also serves as the basis for our message, comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. The end, it's really the end of the story of Joseph and his brothers. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father, their father Jacob, was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of our God. Let's continue by singing our psalm for today, Psalm 103, which is the setting, O oh, bless the Lord, my soul. my tongue to bless his name whose favors are divine oh bless the lord my soul Lord, let his mercies lie forgotten in unthankfulness and without praise as die tis he for Gives your sins, tis he relieves your pain, tis he that heals your sicknesses and makes you young again. He fills the poor with good, he gives the sufferers rest. The Lord has judgments for the proud and justice for the oppressed. His wondrous works and ways he made by Moses known, but sent the world his truth and grace by his beloved Son. Our second reading for this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 29, through chapter 5, verse 2. We saw a little bit what forgiveness looked like with Joseph and his brothers, and now Paul paints that picture for you and me. What does it look like to live as forgiven children of Jesus? And so he says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come from your mouths, Say only what is beneficial when there is a need to build up others so that it will be a blessing to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of every kind of bitterness, rage, anger, quarreling, and slander along with every kind of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Therefore, be imitators of God as his dearly loved children and walk in love, 
just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This too is the word of our God. Let's join in singing our alleluias, our praise the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia, the Lord our God be blessed. Alleluia, Alleluia, your word brings righteousness. With all your works we praise you, exalt your name forever. Alleluia, Alleluia, sing Alleluia. Our gospel for this morning is recorded in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. When Peter asks Jesus about forgiveness and you know, how, often, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? Should I just do it seven times? And Jesus says, no, more, 77. And then he goes on to tell a story to illustrate that point, that God, the church God wants is quick to forgive. So let's view Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the gospel, the good news of our Savior Jesus. Praise be to you, O Christ. All right, at this time, I'll invite the children to come forward for the children's message. All right, thanks for coming up, Jacob. It's you and me today, right? All right, I got a question for you. If, if you came down the aisle and before you got up here, how would you feel if I shoved you and knocked you to the ground and hurt you? Sad. You'd be sad. All right. What if I said, oh, Jacob, I'm so sorry. Then what might you say to me? Happy. You'd be happy, yeah? Would you say anything to me? If I said, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, what might you say? Would you forgive me? Maybe. Maybe? Yeah? Okay, okay, good. 
That's often what happens when we say the words, I'm sorry. Do, do, are we always very sorry for what we do? Always, yeah. Unless we're really upset, right? Like maybe if somebody hits us or hurts us, sometimes we're not always so happy. And sometimes we want to do the same thing to them. Huh? So maybe you'd get angry and you'd think, boy, I wish I could push Pastor over. wish I could hurt him. Is that what, do you think that's what Jesus wants us to do? No. Jesus wants us to forgive, to, to say, I'm sorry, and, and forgive, and to know that that sin is gone just as much as if Jesus had said it to us. That's what we're going to hear about some more in our message today. Our sin is breaking God's law. That's right. That's right. And when we say, I'm sorry, Jesus, what does Jesus say? He says, I forgive you. And isn't that great news? Good job. Let's, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for helping us. When we, when we sin, when we break your law, thank you so much for the forgiveness that you offer. Help us always to come to you and say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry. Please forgive me and to know that you always do. In your name we ask it. And all God's children said, Amen. All right, thanks, Jacob. And thank you all. It's, it's great to, to have you all as part of this too, as God's children. We're going to continue with our next hymn, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. It's, it's a prayer for us, from us to Jesus, asking us to help us do the same thing that he's willing to do, to forgive everything, quickly, right away. The, the song will be up on the screen. It's the Koine version, and so we'll join together in singing along with the song. Forgive our sins as we forgive. You taught us, Lord, to pray. But you alone can grant us grace to live the words we say. How can your pardon reach and bless the unforgiving heart that crowds on wrongs and will not let old bitterness depart. In blazing light, your plus reveals the truth and dimly know. What trivial debts are owed to us, how great our debt to you. Cleanse the gaps within our souls and bid resentment cease. Then bound you all in bonds of love, our lives will spread your peace. Our lives will spread your peace. God's grace and his mercy and his peace are ours. A gift that he has guaranteed to us through everything Jesus has done. A gift that covers us and enables us to do as we're going to talk about. To be able to forgive as we have been forgiven. God's word that we'll focus on this morning is that story of Joseph and his brothers. The forgiveness that he so quickly offered to his brothers. Even as they come to him the second time begging for forgiveness. 
We'll be looking at that again throughout the message, so feel free to keep that handy in your service folders if you like. Let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, sanctify us. Make us holy by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. In our lives as human beings, I really think that there's nothing that's worse than a guilty conscience. Now, when you're feeling guilty about something, how does that affect you? What, what things happen to you? You feel bad, okay? You feel kind of sick, yeah. You walk on around on eggshells. Yeah, you walk around on eggshells. Good. Grumpy. Grumpy. Can you sleep real well? No. Can you eat real well? No. So a guilty conscience has all kinds of physical effects on each one of us. And it also has mental effects too. When you're feeling guilty about something, can you get it out of your head? No, it keeps playing over and over again, doesn't it? And it is, as it plays, you have all these regrets and you keep saying to yourself maybe, well, I, I wish I hadn't, or if only I had, I wish I could change it, I, I, I want to, but it doesn't change. And the guilt stays there and it replays over and over again. And that's where Joseph's brothers were. They were in this guilty loop. They remembered the things that they had done in the past, even though for Joseph they were long forgotten and left behind. Joseph had ten brothers who had mistreated him. Their names were Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, and Zebulun. Ten brothers who each had their own memories with, uh, connected to their own guilt. Things that they had thought about Joseph, things that they had said to Joseph, and the things that they had done to their brother. And those memories had been haunting them for 39 years. They remembered how their father had so favored their younger brother. He loved Joseph more than us, they had said, because he's Rachel's son. Jacob showed his favoritism for Joseph by giving him a beautiful coat. And as the brothers looked at that coat, it filled them with anger. Joseph wasn't any better than them. He didn't deserve better. Joseph was actually Jacob's tattletale, his informer, his snitch. And when Joseph brought reports about his older brothers, then they'd get the punishment that Jacob doled out for them because they were in trouble. And they hated him for that. They remember their anger when Joseph started telling them about these dreams that he had had, and one of them, their grain sheaves were bowing down to his. And no doubt they had thought to themselves, oh yeah, we're going to bow down to him. We'll see what happens. We're going to make him bow down to us. And eventually they would. They could still picture Joseph walking across the hills toward the flocks and herds that they were shepherding. Here comes that dreamer, they mocked. And as he drew closer, they started to plot and to plan. They wanted to get revenge as their father's unfairness roared in their ears. Let's kill him. How could they have even thought of that as they remembered? But they said it, and they even thought about doing it. Reuben, the oldest, stood up for Joseph at that point, and he said, no, let's just throw him in this cistern in this empty well right now, and... and let that be enough punishment because Reuben was going to come back later and take him home to dad and make sure that he was safe. Reuben would have his own special form of guilt after that moment. He would think back and, and say to himself, if only I had taken him right away back to dad. If only I had saved him from my brothers at that moment, none of this would ever have happened. 
And the brothers who didn't have Reuben's plan thought to themselves, if only we hadn't pulled him out of the pit, looking for profit, selling him to traders, gaining, what, 20 pieces of silver, two for each of us? We were willing to do that. It's no wonder the loop of guilt was playing in their minds, feeling it in their hearts. And when they heard Joseph's story about what had happened to him when he arrived in Egypt after being sold into slavery, their, their guilt multi would multiply. He'd been put to hard labor in Potiphar's household, and then when Potiphar's wife sexually harassed him, Nobody believed the truth, they only believed her. And so where did Joseph end up but in prison? It couldn't have gotten much worse for Joseph. No freedom, no rights. Joseph's life after they sold him could only serve to reinforce their guilt. And then they see him. And they witness his tears at their reunion. Joseph, whom they had sold as a slave, hadn't seen now for 39 years. Suddenly he shows up as second in command of all Egypt with family. And now he says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to give you a place to live and I'll make sure that, that you survive this terrible famine. Didn't make them feel any better. It just made them feel worse. They had done too much, too many times for Joseph to truly forgive them. Ten brothers struggling with their individual and group guilt. And to make things worse, their father had died. Now Jacob had spoken kindly to each one of them before, before he died. He had blessed each of his sons individually, giving them beautiful promises from God, telling them how much he loved them. But hadn't he always loved Joseph more? Hadn't he always acted that way toward Joseph? So now what if Joseph has been holding a grudge this whole time? And now he's been waiting for this opportunity to get back at his brothers. What if he'd just been biding his time until dad died? And now what if he unleashes the wrath of Pharaoh and Pharaoh's prisons and, and guards on them? What if the guilt was threatening to overwhelm them? And so they sent a message. They didn't even dare to go in front of Joseph personally. They sent a message. Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. Would we have been surprised if Joseph had taken revenge on his brothers? No, we, we would expect it, right? Just like they expected it. And why is that? Because we like revenge. It's, a, it's in our nature. When somebody hurts us, you know, if, if I push Jacob down and he was big enough, he'd come and shove me right back. That's our first reaction. It's what I did with my siblings. We kind of still do that every once in a while. And now if somebody hurts me, I'm going to do what? hurt them back. If they did something to me, they're going to get it back twice as bad. I'm going to make sure that they hurt, and I'm going to make sure that it's painful. And even if they apologize, well, I'm sorry, but it's not they're, not, they're not truly sorry. They're not really apologizing. Not until I see a real apology. Does that even make sense? But isn't that how we deal with those who hurt us? Do we realize what we are doing when we hold on to that grudge? Now that's the struggle that the brothers had, right? They think Joseph is holding a grudge. 
I was reading, reading a book, I love to read, and I was reading a book called Fallen uh, about two weeks ago, and, and the main character said this about holding a grudge. Holding on to a grudge is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. So who are we hurting if we're holding on to a grudge, if we hold on to our anger and our frustration and our hurt? Are we hurting the person we're grudging against? No, it doesn't hurt them at all. They probably don't even know and don't even care. And yet what are we doing? We're lifting our grudge to our lips like fine wine and sipping poison and taking it in every day and expecting, oh, it's gonna hurt them. When in reality, who is it hurting? Us, slowly poisoning our souls, filling us with all those things Paul talked about in that letter to the Ephesians, bitterness, malice, anger. All we can do is hurt ourselves and our souls by holding on to a grudge. Joseph wasn't holding on to a grudge. He hadn't been sipping at that poison. Joseph had already let it all go. He'd removed any hatred or any hurt from his heart because he had seen how God was doing incredible things. And so when his brothers came to him with this request for forgiveness, again, when they, he thought they had already dealt with it, Joseph burst into tears, feeling sorry for his brothers and feeling terrible about the guilt that they were still having hang over their souls. As Joseph is weeping, his brothers come into the room. They throw themselves on the ground before him and they say, Joseph, we are your servants. We are your slaves. Isn't that a true sibling reaction too? You know, if you hit them and you're, if, if I hit my sister, let's be honest, if I hit my sister and she starts crying, the first thing I would say is, go ahead, hit me. You know, hit me back because I know mom's going to hear you in a second. So just hit me. Let's get it over with. So Joseph, please just make us your slaves. We'll do the dishes. We'll clean the house. We'll watch your kids. We'll do any menial tasks you want. Just, just forgive us. Don't torture us. Don't kill us. Joseph had already recognized where a grudge might take him. Now, Joseph could have made them pay, couldn't he? He could have gone where only God says he should go, with revenge and judgment and punishment. Joseph is second only to Pharaoh. And who is Pharaoh to the Egyptians? He is God. And so Joseph is the right-hand man to God. And so he can act with that divine authority and he can do anything he wants to those brothers. Anything. Oh, can you imagine the payment he could exact? The humiliation? But Joseph wants none of that. Instead, he humbly says, am I in the place of God? Joseph is no different from his brothers. He was the little snotty brat who told on his brothers, who spied on them, who lorded it over them. He was just as sinful as they were. But then he goes on to say, you intended to harm me. That's, that's the honest truth. You did. And, and they, would, they had admitted it too. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And so 39 years earlier, when mean older brothers had the plan to get rid of their snotty younger brother, God had a greater plan. A good plan. And it really had nothing to do with Joseph and his brothers. It had everything to do with a promise that he had made to Joseph's great-grandfather Abraham, his grandfather Isaac, and his father Jacob. The promise wasn't to, to say, Joseph, you're never going to go to be a slave. You'll never be in prison. You'll never go through these hardships. And your brothers will never be mean to you. He said, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I will give them all these lands. And through, the, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. <coughs> Jacob had gone on to bless his middle son, Judah. Maybe the worst of all 12 of them. 
He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. With Joseph in Egypt, humbled as a slave, humiliated as a prisoner, raised to a position of authority by Pharaoh, God's good plan to rescue the world through the Messiah is what it was all about. If Jacob and those 12 boys had stayed in the promised land during that famine, they would have died. And the line of the Messiah would have been done. But God had a plan. And he used Joseph through all of this hardship, through all of the pain, to accomplish this plan for his perfect purpose. You know, even at this point, if Joseph had been carrying the baggage of all these hurts, he could have at least directed a few choice words at his brothers. You know, oh, you stupid fools, you idiots, you are so dumb, I am so big. But Joseph flees that temptation just as surely as he fled Potiphar's wife when he said, how can I do such a wicked thing and, and sin against God? Joseph doesn't drop to that level. Instead, he offers them what Jesus was teaching about in that parable, what Paul spoke of at the end of Ephesians chapter 4. He spoke words of forgiveness. Forgive the offense of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. The brothers asked for it and Joseph freely gave it. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph did what the unmerciful servant did not do. He didn't grab his brothers by the throat and demand repayment. He gave them mercy and forgiveness. He lifted their sins away from them, pushed them to the side and said, God has taken care of your sin. The, the translation there is, <clears throat> is really beautiful in the Hebrew. It literally says, Joseph comforted them and spoke to their heart. And one translation put it this way, Joseph reassured them with kind words that touched their hearts. He gave them the only thing that could deal with their guilt. Forgiveness, mercy, grace. Isn't that the church that God wants? A church that quickly forgives and offers it freely? That can only happen to us when we recognize how much we have been given. If anyone in this universe should be holding a grudge, who do you think that is? God. God should be holding a grudge because of the way that we have treated him. As soon as something goes wrong in our lives, who do we, honestly, who do we blame? We blame God. You put me here. You gave me this person. You said life should be going smoothly, so why isn't it? As soon as we get into an argument with family and friends, what do we do? We just take it deeper. We hurt them more. Even when God has said, no, don't, you speak kindly, speak lovingly, speak forgiving words to them, we do the opposite. If anybody should take out a grudge on us, it's God. He should have dumped his wrath on us a long time ago, wiped us out and started all over. But instead, what did he do? He poured out his wrath on another son, a descendant of Jacob, one whose brothers abused him and ignored him and pounded on him. One whose best friend put a price on his head, not 20 pieces of silver, but 30, just a, a slight increase because of inflation. The leaders of his people laughed at him, had him beaten. Soldiers threw him in a jail cell, just like Joseph. And then said, let's kill him. And they did. 
Jesus endured all of that and could so easily say, just as Joseph had said, you all intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Jesus' cross should be the ugliest thing we've ever seen because that's where God took out his grudge on us, but instead Jesus' cross equals forgiveness. Jesus' cross equals life. It equals our greatest good. And that's why God sent him to take care of every one of our sins, to say your sins are lifted off, taken away, gone. That forgiveness of Jesus becomes the catalyst, the fuel to drive ourselves to be that one who forgives just as quickly and completely as God has forgiven us. We heard Paul say it in Ephesians chapter 4 a little earlier. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's not like the unmerciful servant, right? Looking at each other through the lens of what do you owe me? What have you done to me? But rather looking at each other through the lens of what Jesus has done and seeing, oh, this person needs Jesus' mercy and forgiveness just as desperately as I do. And to offer that freely, without cost, without hesitation, comforting words spoken to their hearts and Jesus' promise is there. Do we need the perfect apology from somebody who sinned against us? Do we need a special responsive reading or a point-by-point -point confession from them to know that they are truly sorry for what they've done? No. We can just forgive with Jesus' words of comfort and hope. What if we're like the brothers? And it's our own sin, our own guilt that troubles us and comes back to replay over and over again in our heads. What do we do then? Well, we could do what we heard in the song in, before church started, a song by Matt Marr. I run to the Father, fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. That's where we go. Because we're not going to find peace for guilty consciences by ourselves. We have to go back to the one who offers forgiveness quickly and completely. And that's the church God wants. Not people who hold on to bitterness and malice and anger, who hold on to that grudge and, and sip from that poison every day thinking it's gonna hurt someone else and instead hurting ourselves. No, that's, that's not the church God wants. He wants a church who's like him a king forgiving an unforgivable debt, a family welcoming the prodigal home without question, without issue, but with arms open wide, saying, I love you and I forgive you. Amen. With that forgiveness, then I pray that peace of God will cover your hearts and cover your minds so that even as we struggle, we know that we are forgiven. Amen. We've heard some amazing things from God with his promises and now we have the chance to say we believe it. So let's join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page nine in your service folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we hear and confess these amazing things about our God, now we have the opportunity to show him our thankfulness. And so we do that by bringing our offerings. For our prayers this morning, we have our prayer list in our service folders on page 13. Does anyone have anything that they would like to add to that list this morning? Any prayers you'd like us to join in together? Marianne? Okay. Will do. Anybody else that you'd like to add? All right, then would you please stand and join me in prayer. Dear God, your mercy and your forgiveness is unbounded. We are truly amazed because we see so often that what you give us we don't deserve, but you give it anyways. You give us your love and your forgiveness so beautifully, so hugely, and so often, Lord, we take it for granted or we hold on to it and refuse it to someone else who needs it. So, Lord, help us to reach out with that same mercy and forgiveness, to forgive quickly and completely, to know that as we let go of our hurts and our grudges, that we find life in you and hope in you. And we pray that the people that we forgive find that same life and hope. Lord Jesus, we know that you love to heal those who are sick. And so we bring before you all kinds of people on our list for Pastor Marty and his wife, Wendy, for Vinnie and Vanessa, Linda and Willie and Kurt. Lord, each one has different issues that they're dealing with in connection with their health. You know all of the details, you know all of the causes, and you know all of the treatments. And so we pray, Lord, that you would place your healing hands on each one of them. Grant them strength, full recovery, and the opportunity to, to thank and praise you for the gifts that you give. Lord, please continue to bless our Native Christian Network and the work that they're carrying out as they seek to connect with tribes throughout North America. Please send the right person to serve as the coordinator here in the Four Corners area so that we can continue to do our work and, and spread it farther and farther. Lord, keep blessing Christ the Rock and each of its members as we connect with people around us. Help us to invite them and encourage them and, and help them to see you as the one who has forgiven everything. We ask all these things in your name and we join together in the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen.